let's take you to here's here's a tower at Machu Picchu. Um, they maybe this was an astronomical tower, but there's not really like a. Um, so what's interesting is I believe that that's one window, and you can see how it has the knobs on them. Uh, those yeah. knobs are seen all throughout the world, and and there nobody quite knows why this so the knobs are like another pretty compelling argument that a lot of people really dive into these knobs are seen in egypt they're seen in uh, baalbek they're seen in ancient china they're seen in mexico they're seen all over the planet on these giant uh, megalithic stones and i wouldn't say that these are giant megalithic stones but they're these are huge stones and these are made out of granite and as you can see there's no mortar in between them mm -hmm. they're perfectly fit to each other so these were master stone masons what were the knobs for? Do they speculate? <clears throat> well, um, I would think, I would think that a, a reasonable guess would be somehow to move these stones. But what's interesting is that they're not on every stone. But knobs that look exactly like that are seen all throughout the world, and there isn't really a there isn't really a, a definitive great explanation for what they were used. You would think that maybe they would have some kind of rope that they would tie around it to use as leverage to be able to move the stones more easily. Right. But uh, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a systematic way in which the knobs are uh, carved out onto the blocks. It's, it's almost, it's very random. And, uh, and I don't think that this is, it's obviously not natural. Um, so that's, that's one of the, that's one of the more compelling mysteries that ties a lot of sites around the world together. And an interesting thing about these sites <clears throat> is that they have construction. Uh, well, these are some of the scoop marks that, oh, we'll, that we'll get to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, you, so these are some, this is some evidence of, of like scoop markings, almost where like the block is, it's like a, I've seen it described as like if you were to stack a bunch of, uh, if you were to stack a bunch of cinnamon rolls in a microwave and heat them up and they swell up next to each other. Well, there are legitimate archaeologists uh, like Dr. Ed Barnhart, who's like a mentor of mine, who he thinks that these blocks may have been somehow melted into each other. And um, oh, this is the geopolymer theory. Well, no, I don't think I don't think that he I don't think that he believes in in the geopolymer polymer theory. I think that that that's based in like that like, like they were liquid and poured into place. Right, like cast. Yeah, this yeah. Is a little bit different. This is a little bit different. So what he thinks, and I don't have. Uh, I don't have any photos of what I'm about to mention, but there is evidence of of roads that are coming from these massive megalithic Peruvian sites, such as uh, Machu Picchu, Cusco, um, Cusco, Peru. People think of it as a modern day city, but it was it was one of the it was one of the citadels, one of the capitals of the Inca world. So the Inca, whether they built these sites or not, knew that that was a place of importance. That's an ancient city. Cusco is, but the modern day city is built on top of it. Right. But every time there's an earthquake, the modern day city falls down and the megalithic ancient city still sits there. It's been surviving this entire time. That's actually happened two other times. In the 1650s, the Spanish, you know, they arrive in Cusco, they melt down all the gold. The Inca were master goldsmiths. So they had these giant gardens with life-size trees, life-size llamas, animals that, that were in there, all made out of, all made out of gold. And and the Spanish uh, chroniclers that were there, they write down that it was some of the most majestic sites that they'd ever seen. Well, Spain's in a really tough place economically at the time. So the Spanish, they melt down all of the Inca gold. The insides of their temples are lined with gold plates. Um, and they have a, uh, they have like a, it's like a, it's like a golden, almost like a giant coin of some sort. And I believe it survived, uh, but it depicts their God, the fanged deity, which we'll get into because that leads to all of these ancient Peruvian civilizations that people are fascinated, that people, guys like Ben are fascinated by, Graham Hancock is fascinated by. All of this is connected to a civilization that's never been found that exists in the Amazon. But we'll, hopefully we'll get into that at some point. But anyways, um, so... The Spanish, they try to cover up the city of Cusco. They, they take down all the gold, all the Inca gold that was there. They take it all down and they try to dismantle these, uh, like the, the city that's built out of granite that's there. Then they can't do it. So then about uh, in the 16, early 1600s, they just build their own city of Cusco on top. This, you know, the Spanish, they've killed off all of the native Peruvian people or enslaved them or whatever. Now they're all indentured people living around. So the Spaniards that are living there build their old, own city on top. Well, a massive earthquake comes in. 
And the, the ancient city of Cusco is built on a soft foundation that allows it to move and roll a little bit. And then it settles back into place. And there's not mortar that's going to crack and separate and allow the blocks to fall out because the blocks are placed perfectly together. So the entire Spanish city of Cusco falls and then the original megalithic city is underneath. Well, then they build it again. And then 300 years later in 1950, another, you know, like class nine earthquake comes in, knocks the whole city down, and then the ancient city is still standing there. So, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So, um, no, this theory that Dr. Barnhart proposes is not a geopolymer theory. What they found is they found archaeological evidence of ancient roads that lead out of these sites like Machu Picchu, Cusco, Saxe Waman, Alente Tumbo. Um, and there are roads that go out of these sites and from places like uh, Chavin de Hantar. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. So Chavin de Hantar is, we'll get into that. Um, and, then, uh, and then from Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is a big mystery. Ben's got a video on Tiwanaku. Right. Um, it's, yeah, I believe uh, uh, Arthur Poznanski is the archaeologist who, uh, pro he was the first guy that proposed that Tiwanaku is of great antiquity, you know, up to 12, 5,000 years old. But they have found ancient roads that are leading out of these sites into the desert south of into the desert south of of these civilizations, into the deserts of Chile, um, and around the area of the Nazca lines. And so, in there, there are these acid deposits. And these acid deposits, scientists have proven that these acid deposits can melt and fuse granite. And that ties into um, what? yeah, that ties that ties into a lot of the local legends that the indigenous people have have said about the area that that their god like used acids to mold clay to build people. And so what they're finding, and this is like a frontier of archaeology. There's only so many people looking into this. And Peru is a, a Peru and Chile. They're not very wealthy countries, and the very last thing that gets money is archaeology. So this is kind of. This is like a this is like the a, a outer edge of archaeology that's being studied right now, but there are like acid wells and acid mines that are in the deserts out there that have acid that's powerful enough that many archaeologists believe to fuse these granite blocks together, and that literally ties in to exactly what the local Tiwanaku people who still carry on their culture from these sites. That's like exactly the oral legends that they that they believe, and oral legends is like. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of dogmatic archaeologists, especially in the old world, in the new world, it's not like this. In the new world, people really value what the locals say because there's kernels of truth in there that are like vital. It's the heart of what people are looking for. And so, you know, like the story of Atlantis, that's based on that's based on an oral legend. Right. You know, that's that's based on what Plato told his students that Solon, you know, had passed down to him that Solon visits ancient Egypt and what, 600 BC, and they tell him that 9,000 years before this civilization was destroyed, that's 9,600 years, boom, that ends up lying, aligning with the younger Dryas. There's something there, you know, regardless of what, of what any scientists want to say, there's something there. And oral tradition, a lot of times ends up being correct. So oral tradition in this case, alludes to some kind of acid being used to build structures and they and there, there's some somewhere in there which we know this isn't true but that their gods use these acids to mold clay to build human beings as well um, which also ties in which is like similar to the christian story of how we were made from the dust of the earth and that kind of ties into like the white god viracocha who was in south america that whisked people out of the dust of the earth and everything it's it is really interesting that as you study this you start to see like wow that Veracosha in some ways kind of sounds like old world gods, you know? And so there's some loose connections there that I don't deeply study, but you pick up on a lot of these things and notice some really strange similarities. Ooh.